Assalamualaikum and hello everyone. Welcome back to Fireside Chat. I'm Nurul Atika Sarji and for today's episode of Fireside Chat, we are with the Director Centre for Islamic Thought and Education at University of South Australia, Professor Muhammad Abdallah. Assalamualaikum, Professor. Waalaikumsalam. How are you? I'm excellent, alhamdulillah. And you? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. Thank you so much for having your time with us. My pleasure. So, ladies and gentlemen, in this episode, we want to discuss more depth into the Islamic world issues. Let's move on to the very first question. Okay, Prof, uh, since you are from Australia, maybe uh, you want to share with us how the acceptance of Islam in Australia. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. Thank you very much uh, for having me and thank you for this excellent question. Uh, Islam in Australia has been there for a long time. Muslims first came to Australia around 1650 from uh, Salawasi, Makassar, Indonesia. And so uh, Islam has had a long uh, standing historical presence in Australia. In fact, almost 200 years before European settlement. Uh, today we have about 820,000 Muslims in Australia, which is about 3.2% and uh, overall uh, excellent acceptance of Islam in Australia and we are constantly seeing in fact people converting to Islam. Okay, you said that only 3.2% in uh, Australia which means it's the minorities in Australia. So, of course we have the challenges uh, for the Muslim in Australia. Uh, can you share with us about it? Yes, absolutely. So yes, you are right, we are only 3.2%. However, Islam is the second largest religion in Australia now after Christianity. <clears throat> but we do have challenges as a minority community. Uh, for example, one of the challenges is Islamophobia. Okay. Uh, we have had uh, lots of troubles uh, with Islamophobia. Uh, before Christchurch massacre, Islamophobia was quite open. Uh, politicians, some politicians, some media would be very Islamophobic after Christchurch, that Islamophobia went very much online and it has increased many times. So we continue to struggle with that. Another challenge is the identity crisis among young Muslims in Australia, trying to reconcile between being Muslim and being Australian. And this is as a consequence sometimes of Islamophobia, sometimes racism, not feeling a sense of belonging, and so there is, uh, what we, there is a, an identity crisis. Uh, other type of challenges, sometimes uh, it's hard for some Muslims to find work because of their name. Uh, there has been some studies to show that uh, a person who has a Muslim name uh, has a higher possibility of being rejected when applying for a job. So these are some challenges. We already know about the challenges. Can you tell with us what are the great aspects of the Muslims in Australia? Well, that's an excellent question also. There are so many opportunities in Australia and Muslims by and large live, live very comfortable lives in Australia. Uh, they have uh, lots of masjid, lots of mosques, lots of Islamic schools. We have hundreds of masjids which open, are open freely and operate freely without any pressure from government. In these masjids, we have uh, five times Salah, Jum'ah Salah, Tahfiz al-Qur'an, learning Arabic. Uh, we have visitors come to the masjids who are not Muslim to find out more. We have about uh, 70 Islamic schools, which are uh, privately uh, private schools, but uh, well funded by the Australian government. In fact, the funds, <coughs> excuse me, the funds Islamic schools receive are much better than other Islamic schools in other parts of the Western world. Uh, there are opportunities to, 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 to advance in your career. So now we have, uh, I think, uh, two Muslim female senators and uh, one with hijab, the first hijabi Muslim senator. And we have another Muslim in, uh, to, uh, in, in, the, in the federal parliament. And we have few in the, in the state parliament. So there are opportunities if you work hard, uh, there are good opportunities in Australia. Uh, besides, it's a very comfortable life in Australia, actually. There's a lot of support that the Australian government gives 
two people in Australia. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, let's focus more into education. Um, you have done so many research on Islamic studies in schools and also the Islamic education in the West, especially. So, could you share with us uh, your finding and interesting topics on it? Yeah, absolutely. So, we've done a lot of research on that topic. Uh, of course, uh, first thing to note is that Islamic schools do a great job. They are very important and they are very much needed. And they provide a safe environment for Muslim students. Of course, keep in mind, of course, that most Muslim students actually study in non-Islamic schools. Mm. Because uh, the Islamic schools can cater for all of them. So in total, we estimate there are 60,000 maybe uh, Muslims studying in Islamic schools. So the others are everywhere else. Uh, but uh, uh, we found that Islamic schools provide a safe haven in times of Islamophobia and racism and not feeling a sense of belonging. These, young, these youngsters feel a sense of belonging in these schools. They go to the school, there's the, they listen to the Quran, they pray Salah, the sisters wear hijab comfortably, they can fast Ramadan without feeling the pressure. However, we also found that, unfortunately, some of the weakest subjects in Islamic schools often are Islamic studies and Arabic studies. Mm -hmm. And the research that we did to find out what do the students think about how Islam is taught in some Islamic schools. And of course, we can generalize, but from the study, we found that the students often, often feel that in this, at the senior level, uh, the way Islam is being taught, the what is being taught, and the how it's being taught is not always uh, conducive. And so students told us that the way Islam is being taught is, you know, it's uh, boring and repetitive, it's irrelevant to their lives, it's out of context, and it's biased. The same thing with Arabic studies. And so really, uh, the challenge for Islamic schools is to become relevant to the lives of young people, whether in Australia, or other places also. Okay. As we can see, the full Islamic veil, like a burqa, like a niqab, has been banned in European states from public places, like including at the streets, public transport, shops, hospitals, and cinemas. So, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you. First, uh, uh, it's important to note that this is not banned in Australia. The burqa okay. and the niqab is not banned. But you are right, in other European countries, it has been banned, unfortunately. Like in Paris, French. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it, it's highly problematic because it goes against the very fundamentals of uh, the principles of democracy, yeah. uh, which, uh, which advocate free, free speech and free thought and free practice. In fact, the feminist movement, which the West uh, is very proud of, uh, came to advocate for the right of a woman to choose. Uh, and so if a woman chooses to cover her face, that right should be respected. Yes. Regardless of whether we agree with it or we don't agree mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. And this is no different to, say, a woman who chooses to walk around in the streets mm -hmm. unclothed or semi-clothed. Then we may not agree with that, but we respect that uh, the law respects that uh, uh, opinion and that choice and for so-called democratic advanced democracies like France and other places to ban the niqab or the burqa uh, goes very much against their own uh, tenets and principles of democracy and the right for a woman to choose. How can we advocate that women can try to choose? What do you think? What, 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 should, what should we need to do? Well, I think Muslims in these countries are already doing plenty. You know, yeah. Muslims in Muslim in Western nations are trying very hard to mm -hmm. tr to advocate. So mm -hmm. they speak to their government. They try to advocate at the local, state level, at the federal level. I think what might be useful, in fact, to help minority Muslim communities like those in France is some type of pressure from majority Muslim countries. Okay like Malaysia, Saudi, uh, Qatar, Emirates, uh, because they do a lot of trade with those countries. And so perhaps uh, to advocate on behalf of minority Muslim communities, 
uh, and that's all we can do. Uh, definitely, we should never resort to extremism or violence okay. to try to uh, advocate or argue for a viewpoint, mm -hmm. but rather use all the uh, legitimate and lawful means uh, to fight back and to make sure that our rights are protected. Next question is, uh, there is also this notion that young Muslim in Europe are becoming more radicalized. Uh, there were also Australians uh, who participated in the Islamic State a few years back. So how is the situation now after IS uh, lost influence or public attention? Definitely the situation has eased. Yeah. We don't face uh, these issues as much as we did in the past. Mm -hmm. In fact, I recently attended a conference on radicalization of youth that was organized by state and federal government in Australia. Uh, and they are now more concerned about uh, ra radicalization of youth generally, uh, age uh, 9 uh, or 11 to 16 years old. And uh, most of this radicalization, and by radicalization here, we're not confining it to religious extremism, but also white, right, white wing extremism. Uh, there is a rise of that, uh, especially this rise was witnessed during the COVID lockdown, and we are witnessing that now. Uh, and most of the time it's done online without anybody knowing. Okay. So that is a growing a concern for at least Australian government, and it is not specific to Muslim youth, but all types of youth. Okay, cool. Let's focus on our Palestinian brothers and sisters in Palestine. So, in your opinion, what do you think about the current situation in Palestine, not compared to 10 years back? Has the world become more open? Well, not for the Palestinian people. The situation has gone much worse uh, than 10 years ago, Okay. Uh, unfortunately. And that is because uh, Israel today has a very conservative, right-wing, ultra-Orthodox government yeah. that is uh, punitive in nature. Yeah. And that has, and we just saw the last few days, in fact, the raids against few towns in Palestine. Yes. Uh, the daily uh, suffrage suffering of the Muslim, the Palestinian population, uh, killing of innocent people, men, women, and children. So despite the fact that the world talks about, you know, uh, diplomacy, and there is lots of talk about ending the war in Russia-Ukraine war, mm -hmm. and that's rightfully mm -hmm. uh, true. We should end these wars and conflicts. But not the same is said about the Israel-Palestine yes, conflict, yes. unfortunately. Because it's a Muslim country. Well, uh, the Palestinian cause, the Palestinians are not all Muslims, as you know. There yeah. are Christian Palestinians, Muslim Palestinians, and they're all fighting the same yes. hegemony. They're fighting a Zionist hegemony that has occupied their country. But because of, I think it's a lot of political interests, okay. uh, self-interests by governments, that they don't want to exert the same pressure on Israel because they see it as an ally, mm -hmm. whilst they see Russia as, a, as an enemy. Okay. And they see that Israel plays a strategic role for certain Western nations, America, Australia, mm -hmm. Canada, and otherwise. And so they continue to support it blindly almost, and uh, at, the, at the expense of the Palestinian populations. It's all about the international diplomacy issue. Absolutely. I mean, there is the diplo uh, international diplomacy issue. It's to do with uh, strategic interests. It's to do with economic interests and so forth. Okay. The West Bank has been under siege for the past few weeks. What is your take on the situation? Well, it's very heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, we have family. I have family in Palestine. Oh, and, so you uh, have a family in Palestine. And uh, it's heartbreaking to see... <clears throat> Uh, the aggression of the Zionist regime and the Israel government on these Palestinians. Uh, it's almost a common occur occurrence, sadly. And it comes back to the earlier point, there isn't enough pressure exerted 
uh, on, uh, on Israel. I must note, however, the Labour government in Australia now, we have a Labour government, and the Labour Party, m most of the members of the Labour Party are trying to pressure the Prime Minister to recognize the, oh. the state of Palestine. So there is that wide, uh, there is a, a, a rising movement mm -hmm. worldwide mm -hmm. that recognizes the, the suffering of the Palestinian people and the injustices committed against them and the need to recognize the state of Palestine and to do more to help the situation. Is anti-Zionism or criticism of Israeli policies anti-Semitic? Absolutely not. I mean, uh, you will find even uh, Jewish scholars, Jewish activists, both within Israel and outside, who criticize Israel. So yeah. can we say that these Jewish people are anti-Semitic? No, absolutely no. not. Uh, the, the, the label anti-Semitism uh, uh, has been used as a weapon mm -hmm. against any form of criticism against Israel. Uh, there has to be fair criticism of Israel, and that should not be seen as anti-Semitism. No doubt, if uh, the Jewish people as a community, say for example in Australia, are attacked because of, of their uh, Jewishness, then that amounts to anti-Semitism. If they are racially vilified and so forth, then yes, we could say that is anti-Semitic, just like we say attacks on Muslims is as Islamophobic. But criticism of Israel should not amount to anti-Semitic. Just like criticism of the West should not amount to being you know, anti-Western, uh, but rather uh, it's in the spirit of uh, uh, fair uh, criticism of real injustices that are taking place. Right, okay. It's not about the anti-Zionism or everything. Well, it's not about anti-Semitic. Yeah. So Zionism, yes, it is about anti-Zionism because Zionism is a political movement mm -mm. that sought to uh, and has colonized and occupied Palestine. And so you'll find many scholars, Jewish and otherwise, many activists, Jewish and otherwise, who are uh, uh, anti-Zionist. Uh, but that, that, that does not mean they are anti-Semitic. Okay. All right, let's fly to Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the only country in the world where the girls are prohibited from going to secondary schools, women have also been effectively squeezed out of the public life, removed from their most government jobs, and paid a fraction of their former salary to stay at home. This is so sad for me because uh, all the Muslim women in Malaysia can get their education. I mean, like can wear, like can do practicing Muslim. We we can wear our hijab and we can go to schools. It's very sad and depressing, but because of the Taliban beliefs in a strict interpretation of religious laws that can severely limit the human rights of its citizens, especially towards women. So while in Islam itself, education is really important and women is really important too. As we can see, the mm. pro, uh, our, our Prophet Muhammad wasallam is really love women. So without this, uh, in in Islam, without discriminating discriminating against the gender. So you are also from the education background. How to change this? Well, first we need to recognize that that is not what Islam says. Okay. Islam, as you have rightly mentioned, has made it compulsory upon men and women to seek knowledge. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi says, "Talabul ilmi faridatun ala kulli muslimin wa muslima." the seeking of knowledge is fard, is compulsory on yeah. every Muslim, man and woman. Yeah, and, and, uh, and in fact, Islam is revolutionary in this regard because it did not confine the seeking of knowledge to men only, but it made it compulsory, a religious obligation. Okay. It's not even an option. Mm -mm. It's a religious obligation to seek knowledge because with that knowledge, you won't be able, number one, to worship Allah properly and number two you won't be able to construct the earth that he gave us and if you look at the history of Islamic civilization in fact you will find women were engaged in all aspects of life and uh, for instance in one of the most complex and sophisticated branches of Islamic uh, knowledge known as ilm, ilm al hadith the sciences of hadith we know for we know we know now that there were at least 
8,000 female Muslim scholars of hadith of the highest order. Okay. And they were, the, they were the teachers of many great um, male scholars. For example, Al-Imam al-Baghdadi was, uh, was an 11th century uh, uh, prominent uh, scholar of hadith and of jurisprudence of sharia and so on. And he was rec regarded as the peerless scholar of his time. Uh, one of his uh, teachers was the great Karima al mirwaziya who was the grand scholar of Sahih al-Bukhari, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. She was the shaykha of mm -hmm. her time. Yeah. And it is said anyone who got the license to teach from her, it was equivalent to a doctorate from Oxford or Cambridge today. So we need to recognize that Islam, it's not Islam that has a problem, yeah. but it is the sadly Muslim culture. Most and important. so how do we solve that the first the most well the most important thing to resolve this is through education mm -hmm. we need to advocate more for education we need to speak more about what islam says about education we need to teach our youngsters about the legacy of islamic civilization and the important role women played when umar ibn al-khattab became khalifa first he appointed a superintendent of the markets of medina who was a woman yeah right and so on. So I think uh, m most of the time the, 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 the failure to practice Islam properly and implement it is because of our lack of knowledge of Islam and because of cultural uh, influences. Okay, you say about the cultural influence, right? Why, why it took so long time for them to change the, the culture? Is it not enough for everyone to advocate? Okay, I think it's important to realize that Islam doesn't have a problem with culture per se. Yeah. Right? Islam sees culture in a positive light. And it says we should always take that which is good, useful, and beneficial from any culture and make it, make it part of who we are. However, sometimes uh, we may, uh, whether we are aware or not aware, mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. cultural practices and norms that are actually negative from an Islamic perspective. Mm -hmm. And because they become, that's the very essence of culture, it becomes part of the daily practice and habit of people. Okay. And it's very hard to change habits overnight. Okay. And that's why it'll have to take time, but we have to start somewhere. Okay. Uh, and educational institutions can play a very important role. Uh, and indeed, every Muslim of authority yeah. can play an important role role by advocating the, the, the essence of Islamic teachings, the, the legacy of Islamic mm -hmm. civilization in terms of its, uh, of its uh, positive relationship and the way it works with cultures, uh, but also, you know, to be patient, mm -hmm. uh, but put the necessary steps in place, uh, the right institutions, uh, fund projects and research in order to uh, create further, uh, better understanding. Of, of Islam and the teachings of Islam. To create better understanding of Islam. All right. So overall, how can Muslims improve themselves and be better as we are continuously monitored and watched by the world? Thank you very much for that. Also, ex excellent question. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran uh, uh, that Allah does not change the state of a people until mm -hmm. they change themselves. Yeah. So we, not, we, we must begin with us, each one. You begin with yourself, I begin with myself. And undertake an inward, inward uh, accountability, sense of accountability. When each one of us begins to look inward and look at how much do I actually know of Islam? How much have I, am I actually practicing Islam? And by that, I don't mean externalities only. Okay. It's not just the packaging. You're right. <laughs> we call this the packaging, important packaging. And it's just not about salah. Salah is important. Yeah. But do we, how much do we backbite and do we slander every day? Mm. How much envy and jealousy do we have? Mm. And this is why Muslim scholars have always uh, focused on not only the legal aspects of Islam, but the spiritual aspects of Islam. And through tazkiyah and purification of the heart, they said that we need to uh, uh, we need to recognize the 
spiritual diseases that each one of us has, such as backbiting and slander and envy and jealousy, and then work to fixing that. That's number one. So it starts with the individual. I mean, imagine if there's 10 of us, and the 10 of us, each one starts working on themselves to improve themselves, that then that's 10 better people. And those 10 better people begin to manifest and practice Islam in better ways. That has a ripple effect, right? Uh, the short, the short, we always want the quick, short, short way to answers. And we begin to point the finger at everybody else. They need to fix themselves and we forget ourselves. Like one wise man said, when you remember, when you point your finger at somebody, three fingers are pointing at you. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. That's number one. So yeah. the, secondly, we need to improve our educational institutions. Yeah. And we can only do that if we do the proper research to understand how they are going, where are the strengths, what are the challenges, and how can we improve it. Number three, generally Muslim, uh, Muslim countries, majority Muslim countries, do not invest in research and development like Western nations do. Okay. And so there has to be heavy emphasis on research and development especially our higher education institutions. The focus should not be only on teaching, but there should be a heavy focus on research and grade A research, class one research. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then, of course, at the, the family level. Uh, so these are some things that can help us, inshallah, move forward in the right direction. Inshallah. We would like to say thank you so much, uh, Professor Muhammad Abdallah, for having your time with Sina Daily Fireside Chat. We got so much information on the Islamic world issues today. It's been very honored to speak with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And for those who want to catch this video again, or the other Fireside uh, Chat, or the other exclusive videos, don't forget to log on to sinadaily.my website and all Sina Daily social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm Nurul Atika Sarji. Thank you so much for tuning in.